I hope that that was a blessing to you as well. Amen, amen. God be praised. To God be the glory for the wonderful things that he has done. Hallelujah. Change. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Thank you for joining us this morning for worship. Amen, amen. We'll be in the book of Romans chapter 12, beginning with the first verse. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us via Facebook Live. God be praised. One of the things that I continue to say during this season is that as much as we want to be back in our respective churches to worship, we praise God for the platforms that he has given us to share his word, to worship, and even to fellowship. To God be the glory. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version this morning, and it reads, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, and the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this preaching moment. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. I don't believe a day goes by without us saying some type of statement about the state or condition of the world. Even before March, there were many concerns, but they have been multiplied, and the world seems darker, more complicated, more sinful, more selfish, more chaotic, and more disturbing to live in. I'm sure you've heard or said things like, the world is not like it used to be. People are not the way they used to be. Neighbors used to look out for each other. I remember how things used to be, and I remember the good old days. The Bible tells us that we are in the world, but not of the world. In the context of this passage, Paul was writing to those under the Roman Empire persuading the Christian communities living in the imperial center to live not according to the political ideologies in Rome, but rather to live out faith on the basis of what God did in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. John 15 and 19 says, if you belong to the world, it will love as its own. As it is, you don't belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. That's a very interesting thought that the world hates us. And we've been told that the world doesn't care anything about us. Why? Because the world is concerned with self-gratification, with personal gain. It is a problem when Christians want the same things that the world wants, when Christians just get in where they can fit in. People of God, we are not supposed to fit in. We are supposed to be different. We are supposed to stand out and not just be outstanding by the world's uh, guidelines. The world makes others look bad in order for them to look better. The, the world uh, degrades others in order to elevate themselves. Paul has a significant message 
to the Romans about the world in chapter 12. But before he gets to tw chapter 12, he describes these wonderful mercies of God. In the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul is telling about justification and how we're justified from guilt and the penalty of sin. He shares about our adoption in Jesus and identification with Christ. He, he talks about being placed under grace and not the law. He tells of all these wonderful things, being given the Holy Spirit to live within us, to, to knowing the promise of our help in times of all affliction and the fact that we can have confidence that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Paul details all of the, these mercies of God and there are many more. The list goes on and on. And then when he begins chapter 12, he is referring back to those 11 verses, 11 chapters that dealt with the wonderful mercies of God. And he says, I appeal to you brothers and sisters. By the mercies of God, by everything that I've already said, I'm appealing to you. And he's making this appeal based on the fact that God has been good and the mercies of God are being referred to when he says, to present your body as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual worship. Our bodies, this body, our bodies is all that we can offer to God. It's the only thing we have. The, the body entails our emotions and our mind, our thought, our desires, our plans. This body represents the total person of who we are. This is our vessel. This is all we can offer God in service to him. This is all we can give to God in worship to him. In order to live for God, we must offer him all that we are, all that we are as we are represented in our bodies. In the Old Testament, there were animal sacrifices, and the priest would kill the animal and prepare the, the, the offering and place it on the altar, and the sacrifice was very important. But even in the Old Testament, God made it clear that obedience from the heart was much more important. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And, and, and Paul is letting us know that God wants us to offer our bodies as that sacrifice. God no longer wants an animal sacrifice. He wants us to give ourselves to him, daily laying aside our desires to follow him, putting our energy and all of our resources out and available to God and trusting him to guide us, to, to offer and to give our bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable to God. And to, to be a holy and acceptable sacrifice, we must be set apart for God and dedicated to his service. Those who are dedicated to God are pleasing to him because they can participate in his service. This is our spiritual worship. This is our worship. The Greek word for worship, latrine, refers to any act done for God. Anything done for God was worship. Scripture tells us to do everything unto the glory of God. That is our worship. And spiritual can also mean reasonable, which that's how it reads in different translations. It said it is our reasonable act of worship. And this one says our spiritual worship. To serve God is the only reasonable way we can respond to the mercies that Paul had already detailed in those 11 chapters. The first verse of Romans 12 and 1 tells us what to do. We are told to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. But the first part of the second verse tells us what not to do. Do not be conformed to this world. Present your body as a living sacrifice, but don't like the world. Don't, don't, don't comply. Don't obey. Don't observe. Don't, don't get along. Don't adapt. Don't match or line up your life with the world. The two go, don't go together. You cannot present your body as a living sacrifice and do as the world does. 
Don't be like the world. Don't talk like the world. Don't dress like the world. Don't walk like the world. Don't live like the world. Don't think like the world. This warns us that the world system, the popular culture, and the way the world thinks isn't holy. It isn't acceptable. As a matter of fact, it is ungodly and in rebellion against God. Our world is really messed up. It's messed up because there is so much selfishness. There's a misuse of power and authority. There are hidden agendas. There's lack of a moral compass. The world does whatever the world wants to do. The people of this world only care about themselves. And scripture has already told us the world doesn't care anything about us, those who love God. They don't fear God and have no concern for others' well-being. You cannot present yourself to God if you are like the world. One cannot be holy and acceptable to God if you emulate the world. This is an unacceptable sacrifice. In order to please God and be able to worship and serve God, one's mind has to be transformed. We cannot think like the world and be acceptable to God. God does not want a, 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 a sacrifice that is not holy, that is not pleasing to him. It is human beings' natural nature to be selfish and sinful. Just like a child that thinks everything belongs to them. It's mine, it's mine, even when it isn't. That's how the world thinks. The world thinks everything revolves around them, that everything belongs to them, that, that everything that, that has anything to do with them is the only thing that's important. Something has to happen. Something has to change in order for us to be able to be a living sacrifice that God accepts. The mind of the Christian must be transformed. A metamorphosis must take place. Be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. This is the opposite of conforming to this world. The battleground between conforming to this world and being transformed is within the mind of the believer. It's all in the mind. To be right with God, our mind must be right. The transformation of our minds causes us to no longer be led by our feelings and by our emotions and by our own self-gratification. The reason the believer is to be transformed is very important. The believer must prove the will of God. Prove means to both find and follow God's will. If a person's mind is not renewed and focused on God, how can that person ever find and discover the will of God? We can't do it on our own. If a person's mind is not renewed and focused on God, how can that person ever follow and obey God? We can't do it unless our minds are renewed. The transforming of our minds means becoming more and more like Christ. When believers have their minds transformed and are becoming more like Christ, they will want God's will and not uh, the, their own personal wills of their own lives. We will desire for our will to line up with God's will. What God desires is what we'll desire. That comes with the transforming and the renewing of our mind. To conform is to go along to get along. To conform is just to get in with the crowd of the majority. We are called to be transformed non-conformists. Not to conform, be transformed. A transformed mind evolves into a mind more like Christ. Not only are we not to conform to what the world does, we can't conform to what the world thinks about us. So when our mind is renewed, we realize what the will of God is. We line our lives up with the will of God. And when our minds are renewed, we also realize that what the world says about us is a lie. What the world says about us isn't true. What the world says about us does not determine our destiny. When our minds are renewed, we come to know who we are in Christ. When our minds are renewed, it's all about living this life for, for the Lord, not about even living for ourselves. It's living a life sacrificially to the Lord. The world contradicts the will of God. The world doesn't know what is good and acceptable and perfect to God. 
The life of conformity is a life that's led by the flesh. We can't be holy and acceptable to God being led by the, by the flesh. The work of the Holy Spirit is to transform our minds. Victory over the world is gained when the believer's mind is renewed over and over. The scripture says that we are transformed by the renewing, ongoing, the action of renewing over and over and over again. It, we are a work in progress. There are times that we begin to think like the world again. We become discouraged. We become dismayed. We become selfish. And the Holy Spirit is constantly renewing our mind again to be able to think of the things of Christ, to be able to line up our will with God's will. The Holy Spirit is constantly working on us. The believer must focus his or her mind on the things of God. Focusing on living and moving and having our being in God. Being able to concentrate on God and the things of God. Being able to mentally practice the presence of God. The renewing of our mind draws us closer and closer to God. The renewing of our mind causes us to live a life that's more like Christ. We cannot do it on our own. We are not capable of being able to line up our lives to live like Christ. The Lord. We are not capable of offering ourselves as a, a living sacrifice to God that He will accept without our mind being renewed. The transformation that takes place in the believer causes us to take the scripture at its word, to do just what God says do. It is important for us to know that in this renewing of our mind, we learn how to live the scripture. In the renewing of our mind, we learn how to line up our lives with what thus says the Lord. In the renewing of our mind, it's not that we're just readers of the word, we're doers of the word. In the renewing of our mind, we begin to walk in step with God. In the renewing of our mind, we realize that all that I have and all all that I ever hope to be belongs to God. In the renewing of our mind, we find out, and Paul says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. As our minds are renewed, we realize that we're not all that. When we, our minds are renewed, we realize that God is the only one who's large and in charge. When our minds are renewed, we realize that there's nobody greater than the Lord. When our minds are renewed, then we can begin to realize that nothing sent around us. It is not about us. It is not about what we get and what we want. It's all about pleasing God. When our minds are renewed, then we can do this. Not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. But he says, but be of sober judgment. Keep things in the right perspective. Don't begin to think that you're better than folks. See, that's how the world thinks. Because we're not going to be conformed to the world, the world thinks that they're better than others. The world thinks that they're superior and others are inferior. The world thinks that they're better than the poor, than the oppressed, than the unemployed, than the, than the homeless. The world thinks that they are better than the orphan and the widow. But when we realize that we are not who we say we are in terms of thinking of ourselves more highly, we humble ourselves and we realize that all that we are is because of the mercies of God, what God has given us. And then Paul goes on to share with us in this text that not only are we not to uh, think of ourselves more highly, but he begins to use his famous metaphor of the body of Christ. And he talks about us being many members but one body. And he talks about how we are members of each other. See, the, in the world, it's every man for himself. In the world, there's a hidden agenda. In the world, it's all about survival. I don't care what not you survive, I'm just trying to survive. But when our minds are renewed, we begin to understand and appreciate each other and realize that one person can't fall or hurt without the other person falling or hurting and realizing that we are many members with one body and all of us are the body of Christ. And Paul begins to share that as it relates to the giving of gifts and letting know that there are no big gifts and little gifts. There are no inferior gifts and superior gifts. There are no big eyes and little use. Paul is is sharing here that as our mind 
is renewed. As we have the renewing of our mind, we began to appreciate who we are and whose we are. We began to have a new respect for each other. That's how the body of Christ should be. And so as we present ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, we're all presenting all that we have, all that God has given us, we present to him. We present him our gifts. We present him the gift. If it's prophecy, we present that to, to God and we prophesy. If it's ministry, we do that unto the glory of God. If it's teaching, we teach unto the glory of God. If it's to, to uh, exhort, we, we share an exhortation unto the glory of God. If it's giving, we give generously unto the glory of God. It's not about pointing to me and I gave more than you gave. It's not about that because we, we are members of each other. We are members of the same body. And, and if it's leading, we lead unto the glory of God. Paul is letting us know in this passage of scripture that God wants all of us and all that God has given us, all the mercies that we have enjoyed, all the mercies that we have benefited from, it is for the upbuilding of the kingdom. It is for the strength and the wellness of the body. It is not for any one person to be better off or better than anyone else. We are all on the same level. We are all parts of the body of Christ. And the renewing of our mind gives us a greater appreciation and respect for each other. And that's how we can be healthy. That's how we can be whole. The world competes. The world thinks they're better. But in the church, we ought not be competing with, with each other. This person has the, the gift and they can sing a song and somehow they think that they're in the spotlight more and they're more special to God. No! All of our gifts are for all of us to glorify God. We, we belong to each other. When our minds are renewed, we'll think differently. The world thinks in such a dark way, a dreary way, and a hopeless way, but as our minds are renewed, we can think about whatever is true. We can think about whatever is honorable. We can think about what is just. We can think about what is pure. We can uh, think about whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. And if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, we can think on those things as our minds are renewed. And then we can, we can hold captive anything that comes against God in our mind. It is important for our minds to be renewed because our heart and our mind are connected. And, and how we think and, and, and how what's in the center of our hearts dictates our, our behavior. But God is calling us to a place to give ourselves to him fully. Jesus sacrificed his life. He gave his life on the cross for us. He died for us. But God doesn't want a dead sacrifice. He wants a living sacrifice. He wants all of our energy. He wants our time. He wants the resources that he's given us. The energy, the resources, the time that he gave us, he wants us to give it back to him. We have nothing in and of ourselves. All that we have, we got from God, and God wants it back. Are you willing to present yourself as a living sacrifice to God? Are you willing to give yourself away so that God can use you? Are you willing to commit to a life that's selfless before God? Are you willing to, to be that holy and acceptable to God? Are you willing to allow the renewing of your mind to, to discern the will of God in your life that your will will line up with God's will? You won't have any uh, selfish motives and, and, and any the impure uh, intentions that you're just all about glorifying God and giving him your spiritual act of worship? Are you willing to rededicate your life to the Lord and say, Lord, I give myself back to you. I've been holding back but I promise I won't withhold anything. I'll give you all of me. Are you willing to say that, that, that I, 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 I plead the blood of Jesus over my own selfish and personal desires, oh God? Anything that would get in the way of me and you, of me worshiping you fully in spirit and in truth, I, I surrender that to you, oh God. Are you willing to rededicate your life to the Lord today? Because God wants you. He wants a living sacrifice, fully, wholly devoted to him. He says, I'm a jealous God, 
and will not share my glory with anyone. And he created us to worship him, created us to serve him, created us to love him. And he says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, and your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. We cannot do that without the renewing of our minds. I beseech you, my brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. I don't know about you, but I, I feel the need to, to give myself back to God. See, it doesn't matter how long you've been in the church. It, does, it doesn't matter what all you do. You might be an officer. You might be a leader. You might be a preacher. You might be the musician. You might be serving in a various capacities. But have you truly given yourself back to the Lord? The, all that you do is it unto the glory of God. Are you, are you doing it for recognition? Are you doing it for pay? Or what, What's your motivation? Are you fully committed? And there's, there's some people who do things in the church and they don't know the Lord and the pardoning of their sins. That's great that you, that you serve them in the way that you have. It's, it's great that you're a good person, but you have to choose them yourself. You have to repent of your sins. So this is the moment of decision as we, 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 we've been charged, we've been, we've been encouraged to, to present our bodies to God. And now God is waiting for us to respond to that command. Because there's no acceptable sacrifice to God unless it's holy, unless it's pure. God will not accept it. If you don't know the Lord and the pointing of your sins, let me tell you about the one that sacrificed his life. While you were still conforming to the world, while you were yet sinners, while you were doing whatever you wanted to do, Jesus died. While we were yet sinners, he died on the cross. He didn't wait for us to get it right. He didn't wait for us to accept him. We were doing whatever we wanted to do, but yet he died. So he's already proven his love and how far he's willing to go. He loves you unto death. He says you were to die for. So if you don't know him, you can accept Jesus in your heart. You can ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. The word of God says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, then you shall be saved. Receive salvation. And then if you know him, and you know you have not given yourself totally to God. You hold it back. You hold back on your gifts. You hold back on your time. You hold back on your commitment. Are you willing to rededicate your life to the Lord now? This invitation is for you. And no matter how long we've been in the church and how long we've known the Lord and no matter how faithful we've tried to be, if we haven't given ourselves totally as a living sacrifice, now is the time to rededicate and recommit. And even as we give ourselves, we have to keep giving ourselves again because it doesn't take much for our, our mind to slip back into the direction of the world and we begin to think like the world and become dismayed and overwhelmed and lose heart. And we have to realize who we are and the renewing of our mind empowers us and causes us to know once again that God is God and we are God's children and God will provide and God is worthy of the sacrifice that we offer him. If that's you, if you're accepting Jesus or you're rededicating, or if you don't have a church home, you might be listening in, you might be sharing, you might uh, uh, listen to it on YouTube later today, and if you don't have a church home, we extend this invitation to you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is true and will not return unto you void. We thank you, O oh God, that you watch your word to perform it. We hear you speaking to us, O oh God, that you're requiring a living sacrifice from us. You want all of us. You don't want us to just be yours part of the time. And you don't just want a little bit of us. You want all of us. Our whole body and our minds. Lord, we present ourselves to you now. Receive us, oh God. Change us, oh God, and make us more like you. 
Help us, oh God, to be fully devoted like Jesus was devoted on the cross. Just like he would not come down, help us to not withhold our sacrifice from you, that we surrender all to you. Holy, completely, totally. And Lord, for those who are just coming to know you and the pointing of their sins, receive them now. Help them, oh God, to learn and study your word and learn how to pray and talk to you. And then for those, Lord God, that don't have a church home and desire to come and join this church or even perhaps another church you've called them to, help them to be committed and faithful and follow through on the commitment that they're making right now to you, oh God. That they will not just make it in this moment and forget about it. But they will follow through and be men and women of their word. And follow through on what you've spoken into their lives. And for that we thank you. We thank you for hearing our prayers. Any needs among us, oh God, we know that you're able. Any sickness, we know that you're a healer. Where there's great needs, oh God, and unemployment, we know that you're a provider. Where there's chaos, oh God, oh God you, we know that you are our peace. For our children returning to school, for our educators, for all the decisions that are being made, oh God, we need your direction. Cover, protect them, guard them, guide them. So they'll be healthy, they'll be safe. Help us, oh God, to offer ourselves as living sacrifices unto you. This is our prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise. Hallelujah. We bless the name of the Lord. He is worthy. He's worthy. Thank you for joining us. We pray that the word of God bless you today. Go back and read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. And just be blessed in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. Have a blessed week.